All righty. Good afternoon. Welcome from Columbia University in the city of New York. My name is Elisa Douglas, Director of the Columbia Alumni Association Regional Clubs and Alumni Relations. Thank you so much for joining us for our annual tradition, Columbia Connects. Connects programming brings Columbia alumni together for fellowship and networking and to welcome new graduates to the community. For the first time this year, we have included a number of virtual sessions for our alumni all around the world to connect in an engaging and interesting way. We are excited today for our last virtual talk as part of our Columbia Connect series. Today's talk is with Professor Ken Jackson on the roller coaster of history, the rise, decline, and rise again of New York. Our talk will include a presentation with Professor Jackson for 20 minutes. We'll follow that by a Q&A session that Professor Jackson will respond to previously submitted questions. If time permits, we will turn it over to live chat for questions. I would now like to introduce our speaker. He has been called a legend. Ken Jackson is director of the Herbert Lehman Center for American History and the Jock Barzin History at Professor, uh, Professor of History at Columbia University, Arden. He has also been a chair of the Department of History in his tenure. He's a frequent television guest and he is best known as an urban historian and a preeminent authority on New York City. I now present Ken Jackson. Columbia alumni about a subject near and dear to my heart and also presumably of interest to you because you went to Columbia and you know New York City. So let me, um, we've got a lot to cover in a fairly brief period of time. So let me um, show you some illustrations and, and move through them. And then we'll talk about the rise, decline, and rise again of New York City. And let me put some of these images on the board here. I'm not seeing them. Come up. Are they ready? Yes. OK. The first image, of course, is just an aerial view of the region you're familiar with. Uh, the uh, blue space in the middle of the thing is the upper bay. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Barrows out on Narrows Bridge connecting Staten Island and New York, which is really traditionally entering the harbor of New York City. You see uh, New Jersey on the left. That's uh, Bayonne, and then you see Manhattan, the central part in the middle. Um, what I want to do is just talk briefly about the history of the city to point out that New York is old, really the oldest city in the United States. You know, St. Augustine says it's the city, but really, if there ever was a city, you know, it's really a little forward from the place where we thought the settlers put down roots. Jamestown in 1607, but that was abandoned uh, in favor of Williamsburg. Santa Fe was really not part of the United States until much later, and it wasn't very important until after World War II. And then you have Plymouth Plantation where the pilgrims came. The Plymouth 1620, and of course, that's disappeared. It's been rebuilt, but nothing that was original is still there. And it's a wonderful tourist attraction. But you see that New York is older than Boston, older than Charleston, older than Philadelphia, older than Savannah, older than New Orleans. So it's really the oldest city uh, in what's now the United States. But I want to argue about what's special really quickly. The location, of course, is unique. The age is very old. It's obviously the biggest city in the United States. But to talk about aspiration, toleration, diversity, density, change, and resiliency, I just point out that in 1890, about 125 or 30 years ago, New York was already the second largest city in the world, if you consider Brooklyn as part of it. And considering that in 1800, New York had been just an insignificant dot on the map, and here it is bigger than Paris and Berlin and Vienna and Tokyo. And then the top 10 cities in the United States in 1900, you can see it's about twice as large as Chicago maybe um, a little less than three times as big as 
So we'll be okay. And then you see some cities that are no longer in the top ranks of American cities. St. Louis, Boston, Baltimore, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Cincinnati, all of which have kind of dropped down in this period of time. Now the largest American cities in recent times. And you can see that New York is about twice, with more than 8 million people, more than twice as big as the next largest American city, Los Angeles, and three times or so Chicago. By the way, these are, this is the city, not the metropolitan region. If it were the metropolitan region, then New York would have about 23 million. Los Angeles would have 15 or 16, and Chicago about 10. Um, so let's keep going here. And I want to just talk about some character characteristics of New York City that are very important. Aspiration is one of them. You know, there are many people in the world, perhaps most, who don't believe you should try to exceed your parents, exceed anybody. Just be happy with what the Lord has given you and do with that. But America follows a different drummer in a way, and especially in New York. And I'll put these images up with J.P. Morgan, uh, banker, John Jacob Astor, really a real estate person in New York, and John D. Rockefeller, oil man, really the largest, richest person in the, in the United States at the turn of the century. Those people all kept working. They all made New York City their headquarters. In fact, New York City was a big part of their success. But also from the bottom end of the, of the, of the um, spectrum, you have the poor immigrants coming through Ellis Island at about the same time. And what this shows is that while New York had more than a share of very wealthy people, but also it was the home and haven for people who have barely had two nickels to rub together. And Ellis Island was the arrival point for at least three fourths of all the incoming immigrants into the United States between 1890 and the time they really cut it off in 1924. Um, and then aspiration, even sports, Yankee Stadium, or Arthur Ashe and things like this. But I want to talk about toleration too, because that's a lot of reason people come to New York City. Um, I don't know that people in New York themselves personally are more tolerant than other people in other states, Alabama, let's say. But the circumstances of life in a great city force us to accept difference. In other words, this is an image of Stonewall Inn of a bar in Greenwich Village. And that was where in 1969, the police raided a gay bar and there was, there was violence. But what was interesting about Stonewall and why it's famous in American history is that whereas that probably would have gone unremarked in many smaller American cities, in New York, there were enough people who were gay and who were active to say, hell no, we're not gonna take it anymore. So what was unusual was not the fact that the police beat up on gay people or that there was discrimination, but the New Yorkers could fight back largely because of their sheer numbers. But also you see all through the 20th century, there's an NAACP parade, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, not formed in Mississippi or South Carolina, but in New York City. And there you see a parade on the right. The May Day Parade was really a communist party. The, head, the headquarters of the Communist Party for most of the 20th century was in New York City. We're down at the bottom, Margaret Sanger, the leader of the birth control movement, which was illegal for much of the 20th century, but in New York City, she could speak. Um, diversity, we all know that, that New York is a place of unusual diversity. Little Italy, Greek town, black communities, all sorts of things like this. But here's a chart. It gives us a numerical indication of that, you see that in 1900, of the foreign born, New York City has more than twice as many foreign born persons as any other American city, and that would be Chicago, and it's about uh, four times or more than Philadelphia. And then the other cities you see drop off a lot. But notice the far right at the top, 37% of New Yorkers were foreign born then. That is almost exactly the same number as in 2019. That makes New York City unusual. Now, of course, many immigrants are going first to Miami, Cubans especially, Los Angeles, Houston, uh, Atlanta, Washington. But New York still has more foreign-born than any other single city. They come from more places than 
than other American cities. And New York City has always been tolerable. I mean, it's not just a recent phenomenon as it was in some other American cities. And now look at two million, I mean, 2000. You see New York City has population now more than 8 million, more than twice as big as the next larger city. Uh, LA is 41% foreign born. New York's about 36%. Still, what's surprising here is how low um, uh, Chicago is 21%. Or Phoenix, 19%. Um, so you see that New York sticks out in terms of its, and then density. Well, of course, if we look at this, density means the number of people or the number of square feet of floor space in a given amount of space. Well, no other American city comes even close to New York City. It's more than twice as dense people per acre per square mile than Chicago. And Chicago is the second most dense in terms of American cities. And there you're just looking over the UN, looking over toward New Jersey and all the way to the West Coast. And you can just see the tall buildings. We could have taken this picture in other directions. This doesn't even include all the tall buildings in lower Manhattan. But probably one of the most dense settled, densely settled places in the world. In fact, in 1960, there were only two places as dense as Midtown Manhattan. And one of them was lower Manhattan. And the other was the Chicago Loop. Now, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Seoul, Singapore, a few other cities, especially in Asia, have tall buildings and high densities like New York. But this is still very high in the whole world and certainly far and away the highest in the United States. Change. Even though New York looks old, so if you were to come back to the city or back to the campus now, you'd be familiar with so many things. But what's so unusual about New York City is the way it adapts to change. Uh, well, here's a map of New York City around 1920 that shows industrial areas. You notice they're mostly in lower Manhattan, in Brooklyn, and along the Brooklyn side of the East River, a little bit in the South Bronx. It was the most important industrial city in the world until about 1955. Not that it had automobile manufacturing plants or steel mills or things like this. It had hundreds and thousands of small establishments with 50 or fewer employees, dressmakers, tobacco making things, uh, steel cabinets, as well as some few big, big places. And I'm just going to show one particular industry, brewing. Brewing is now associated with St. Louis and Milwaukee. But as late as 1950, 1960, New York brewed more beer than St. Louis and Milwaukee combined. Earlier in the century, New York had like a hundred breweries. And here are just a few of them. Uh, this is at the 92nd and 2nd Avenue. Uh, here we see National Sugar, Sugar Refining, too. It was also a huge sugar refining center for the United States. It lost those industries. They're almost entirely gone now. And to be replaced with what? Luxury housing. And here's a picture of New York's port. It was the busiest harbor in the world between about 1870 and 1960. And this, this picture, which shows pineapples being unloaded in New York, but they're boxes and then they're bags of things. That's when it took hundreds of longshoremen several days to unload a particular ship. What happened later in 1950s, mid 1950s, they were replaced by containers. So that the hundreds and hundred thousand longshoremen of New York City went down to very few because now you just have these back ends of tractor trailers. They may put socks in them in China, bring them to the port of New York, unload them to the back end of a big truck, and take them to some Walmart distribution center somewhere in the middle of the country. Um, so here is also transportation. New York is a great transportation break. This is the east side of Manhattan earlier in around 20, 1900, you see the mass of ships, the forest of mass. What a place this was. And then in the early 20th century, the west side here, you see ocean liners, because ocean liners, which had originally been on the East River, they got too big and so they could only turn around in the Hudson River. But this, and this is a little bit lower down from where uh, they now unload. New York is the second largest cruise ship port in the United States after Florida. There's Florida has several, but then it's New York City. Um, and then 
I think it's also we we forget how important New York was in World War II. It was the port of embarkation, the place where soldiers and trucks and artillery and tanks were loaded for the trip across the perilous Atlantic Ocean where German U-boats awaited. If the troops left from here, this was the port, and then they came home. And so if you can just stare at this photograph just for a minute, those are not ants, those are soldiers. They had packed themselves onto these ships. They didn't care if they had to stand up for a week. They wanted to go home. And here they are as they come into the harbor and they're all on deck now. They want to see the great city. They want to see the Statue of Liberty. They want to get home to Kansas as soon as they can. But this accounts for a lot of New York's prosperity. And then of course it becomes the capital of the world. Uh, in the late mid and late 1940s when the United Nations establishes its headquarters, which has remained in New York City ever since. Um, now what I really want to talk about is New York's decline. You know, it begins the 20th century right after London and it soon surpasses London and becomes the world's, really the center of the world in the first half of the 20th century. But then um, it begins to decline soon after World War II when most of us don't think of it as declining, but the military, remember, when we have the military industrial complex, that tends to move south and west, away from New York, which had a dense concentration of military bases in World War II. And then what happens is the population of the United States begins to move south and west, away from New York. What you begin to get in New York was, well, here's Jimmy Carter um, in the South Bronx, looking at devastation, at abandonment. Those buildings are empty. Those are six, eight-story apartment buildings, and there's no one there but rats and a few gangs. And what happened was the city recovered. That's what's incredible about New York City, that it was on the path to be another Detroit or Cleveland or Buffalo. They, too, may return to their former glory, but not quite yet. But New York has, and I think we should focus on that. Here's the subway graffiti. If you remember New York in the 1970s, graffiti was everywhere. Now it's hard to be seen anywhere in the New York metropolitan area. It's an indication that the city has improved. Here's also the 1970s, the movie Death Wish, which made, made the suggestion that all you had to do is go outside in New York and walk into a park and you would be mugged. Well, as you may realize, crime has fallen off a cliff in New York City, probably since you were a student at Columbia. Its crime is down more than 80%. We know that from homicide statistics and automobile theft statistics, which are the only ones can really be tr trusted over time. There used to be 20, well, 2,200 homicides at its peak in 1992. Now many fewer than 300, 250 sometimes down from 2,200. And what's interesting about that is the people who still kill each other are mostly drug dealers killing each other or sadly males beating up on girlfriends or wives. Not a lot the police can do for that. At least not yet, we need to work on that. But the, the, the danger is so much less in New York City than in other big cities. Chicago, which I love for example, but is one third the size of New York City and has all, often had twice as many homicides. And that tells us an awful lot about what's happening in New York. Uh, is it, it's now a city under control and that's had an enormous impact on Columbia University that the number of applicants to get into Columbia has skyrocketed. So now it's right around almost the same as Princeton and Harvard and Yale. It's just about the same. It's, so in other words, it's very, very, very difficult to get into Columbia University in the city of New York. And the suburbs, of course, are still here. But what's important, I think, is to think, how did the city recover? Why has the city come back? Well, crime is one reason. Uh, for the city, he rejected help for the city in the 1970s. The city came back anyway. So what do we mean by a resilient statistic or resilient city? Look at the 19... 80 numbers, look all the way to the far right, about four from the bottom, and you'll see 7,071,000. Uh, 
you'll notice that it lost 800,000 people in the 1970s. That's more people than live in those cities. That's essentially the Catholics and Jews from Brooklyn and the Bronx who left the city. And then look what turned around. By 1990, it's up to 7.3 million, to 2000 to 8 point, 8 point 175 in 2010, probably 8.3 or 4. Now, that is stunning because every northeastern and midwestern city which has not expanded its boundaries, and that's essentially all of them, have lost population since World War II. New York is the exception. So what makes New York unusual in the United States is not that people moved out of the city to Scarsdale or Great Neck or New Jersey, but that somebody took their place. In fact, more people took their place than left. So that's just an incredible fact about New York City. Now look at the largest cities and look at the um, land area and the density. In other words, we don't call Kansas a city because it's very low density. New York is a city. If you look at the far right, you'll see that New York is more than twice as dense as the next highest city, which would be Chicago and Philadelphia. New York is 27,000 people per square mile. In Manhattan, it's about 75,000 people per square mile. That's higher than any place in the United States. Now the cities that are as dense as New York tend to be in Asia, where they not only have a lot of people, but they have a lot of tall buildings. Here's an illustration of the homicide situation. And you can see followed over from 1920, a brief spurt there in the Depression, flat and low until about 1960. And then it surges through the 1970s. 1980s and reaches a peak in 1990, 1992. And then look, that's fallen back. So it's now considered among the most safe of all American cities of any size, let alone of great size. You know, let's think of cafes and so on. So think of these changes in a city and what's happened. People now want walkability. They want to walk and see people, and then when one thinks of one thinks of uh, the opportunity to meet attractive partners, how better to do that than in New York or an outdoor restaurant? We once thought of the suburbs as the place to go as soon as you have children. Now, if you're in the city, you see strollers everywhere. People are now making the choice to to stay in the city. And one of the I think most interesting symbols of New York's recovery in recent years is the High Line. The High Line is an abandoned railroad track, essentially south of 34th Street, that runs to about 12th Street. It used to run a little bit longer than that. It was an elevated freight railroad intended to help the factories of the Lower West Side from the 1930 until 1970. It never made a nickel. It would go through buildings. This is railroad track going through buildings above the street level on about the second story, so 20 or 30 feet above the street level, then abandoned in the 1970s as a bad idea, and then it just sat there for 30 years because nobody noticed it. Where else in the U.S. they have an abandoned railroad above ground that nobody seems to even think about? It was there. And then early in the 21st century, a group of people, friends of the highway, began to restore this Structure, spent millions of dollars on it, but they put fancy weeds there. They now have a pedestrian park, no bicycles, no dogs, no nothing like that. This has become a world class tourist attraction. If you have not been to New York City in recent years, you need to go to the High Line. Anyway, there have been many other changes as well. Riverbank State Park, which is at about 100. 35th Street to 145th on the west side, sewage plant. But they've turned that sewage plant into soccer fields, basketball fields, tennis courts, baseball down, all sorts of roller, roller skating rinks and ice skating rinks. And it's safe and it's wonderful. And the city is trying to think of new initiatives, a way to make the city. And then the resurgence. 
the spectacular resurgence of New York in the last generation, let's say since 90, is unbelievable, despite the terrorism at the World Trade Center. Predictions were common in 2001 that the city was doomed. Nobody would ever want to work in a tall building again or go into a dark subway. And here's the second plane hitting the South Tower on September 11, 2001. Here's the incredible smoke and debris from that disaster. Well, you know what? This is what it looks like now. It's now one World Trade Center. They're rebuilding the whole thing. There's a boat basin down there. Uh, and now the neighborhood of Sparkling. Let me just end my quick presentation. This is now the, this is called Billionaire's Row along 57th Street. They're building a hundred story building, selling them to people at least they're called billionaires. And you almost need to be a billionaire because $50 million, $75 million, a case even $100 million will buy you an apartment. Let me quote E.B. White, which I think sums up New York City better than anything I can do. He, you probably know him as the person who wrote The Elements of Style with Leonard Strunk. He wrote for The New Yorker. He wrote children's books. He wrote a little book called Here is New York in 19... 49, really captures the city. New York, he says, brings the gift of privacy with the excitement of participation. And better than most dense communities, it succeeds in insulating the individual if he wants it, and almost everybody wants or needs it, against all enormous and violent and wonderful events that are taking place every minute. New York is peculiarly constructed to absorb, absorb almost anything that comes along. Whether a thousand foot ocean liner out of the west, out of the east, or a 20,000 man convention out of the west, without inflicting the event on its inhabitants, so that every event is in a sense optional, and the inhabitant is in the happy position of being able to choose his spectacle and so conserve his soul. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, now we're gonna open up our Q&A and we're going to go through the previously submitted questions. Our first question, do you believe New York is in a decline, Professor Jackson? And can you compare the current treatment of homelessness to what was done under the administrations of Rudy and Mike? When I came to New York to teach at Columbia in 1968, one of the things I wanted to see was the Bowery. So they were hum homeless people, especially men, and they were in the gutter drinking rut cheap wine, and you didn't see homeless around the country. Now in 21st century, we see homelessness everywhere. And New York is unfortunately got 60,000 People who are homeless every night or don't have a permanent residence. Under the administration of Ed Koch, New York City built more homeless units than the next 50 cities in the United States combined. Did it solve the homeless problem? No. We still have them. Uh, we also have them in San Francisco, which probably has the worst situation in Los Angeles. You know, in Los Angeles, it doesn't rain. At least it doesn't rain for six months of the year from April to October. And so people live in refrigerator boxes uh, in downtown Los Angeles, which you can do. You can't, unfortunately, do that in New York City. So we have not solved our, our uh, homeless problem. Uh, it's no longer the worst in the United States, but it's an embarrassment to anyone who loves the city or loves the United States. It's in some ways, though, endemic to the United States. They have, in Europe, in much of Asia, they have a floor and they're everybody. And the idea is that the nation or the society is responsible for its floor. In the United States, we don't have a floor. We don't have national responsibility for individuals who are sort of down and out. So uh, there is no federal program about homelessness. homelessness. It's mostly uh, state and local initiatives and um, 
It's not going to work. Maybe it'll never work, I think, until we have a federal response. All right, our next question. On the current views and status and future development of trends in the Bronx, can you answer on that and let us know what you project for the future? Well, you know, in the 1977, 78, 76 World Series, when the Goodyear blimp was flying over the Bronx, it is alleged that Howard Cosell said the Bronx is burning, whether he said it exactly that way or other people said it, but you could see this orange glow over the, the Bronx, uh, even as they were focusing on Yankee Stadium. And that did mean that parts of the Bronx were burning. Um, and it was losing population. I mean, not just a few people, but hundreds of thousands in the Bronx. Um, it was losing industry and losing everything, and Crown was up. Um, what's happened in the last, well, since, well since, since the 21st century began, let's say since the World Trade Center came down, is the Bronx has begun to thrive again. One reason is because the crime rate has vastly declined in the Bronx more so there than in Manhattan, where it never was terrible in the first place. Um, secondly, the immigration, one of the big reason for New York's resurgence in the last 20 or 30 years has been the immigration law of 1965. Not so many people came in the first 20 years, but since the mid-1990s, until uh, Donald Trump took office, there was a lot of immigration into the United States, and New York probably got more of it than the other place. Remember the illustration I showed said that New York has more immigrants than any other city. And California has more, the whole state, and Miami has a higher percentage. But New York is still unusual in the number of homeless people, but also immigrants that are here. Immigrants have given new life to the Bronx. They've filled up all those empty houses right here on the Compass, Columbia campus, if you look down in Harlem, which is now, by the way, less than half black, you don't see abandoned units anymore. Those places are being fixed up. Those places in Harlem are now more than a million dollars each. So what we're seeing, and that's a reflection of the safety of the Bronx and the, the excitement of the city. You have beer gardens in the Bronx. You have luxury apartment buildings going up. That's in Manhattan, but it's in, the same thing is happening in the Bronx. Um, so it's now got its population is growing, its crime rate is going down. Uh, I think its prospects are good. And probably smart speculators are buying property there even as we speak. Great. So our next question is, Professor Jackson, I'm curious to hear your perspective on how New York City has fared in light of the recent technological revolution i.e. in what has happened in Silicon Valley challenged New York City's claim as the capital of the world? And what are your projections? Well, New York City is the capital of the world right now. I mean, not because of the United Nations, it's just the center of communications and finance and culture and whole, whole host of things. London is really its only serious rival and London's not quite in the same place as New York. Silicon Valley, of course, the development there in high tech in the last uh, three or four decades has been spectacular. Nobody's going to deny that. And um, the growth of the economy in San Francisco and uh, Mountain View and all those other places has been nothing short of miraculous. But I don't think that's the same thing as being capital of the world. I mean, yeah, it's capital of high tech. And New York City probably now has the second most high-tech jobs in the United States. I mean, I know Amazon didn't put its second headquarters here, which I think was a big mistake for New York, but uh, they're all expanding, including Amazon as we speak. Google has major operations in New York down in the former Port Authority building between 15th and 16th Streets and uh, 9th and 8th Avenues. That building is big as the world, I mean, as big as the Empire State Building. I mean, Google is occupying the whole place. It's just turned on its side. Uh, Yahoo 
Amazon is building big. Um, so New York has got several hundred thousand employees in the high tech industry, and they are second usually in uh, new uh, uh, new investment opportunities in New York to San Francisco. Now, of course, there's still lots of American cities that are competing, but it's interesting that they believe many of these companies believe that New York is the place to find talent. In other words, that if you want to find talented, ambitious, smart person, the kind of people who go to Columbia who graduate from Columbia, you can't just put it up in the middle of nowhere. If you want to find out where those people live, where they want to be, where they want to meet partners, where they want to go out at night, where they want to see ballet and opera and philharmonic and go to great museums, those people are a lot of them in New York, more in New York than anywhere else. So that's why, that's why those high tech companies are coming to New York. Uh, and even Amazon that uh, rejected it to the thing, Amazon is expanding quite a bit in New York as we speak. Okay, so we have time for one last question, Professor Jackson. And our last question is, how has Brooklyn changed in the last 50 years? Well, about um, 40 years ago, maybe a little less, I was the major person in the organization called Brooklyn Rediscovery. And I tried to introduce Brooklyn history classes at um, five Brooklyn institutions, colleges mostly. And the idea then, unfortunately, was that Brooklyn was in decline ever since the Dodgers had left in 1957. And we were trying to reverse it. The reverse it we did, people didn't want to go to Brooklyn. And Brooklyn was losing population. It had been since the 1950s. What a difference a quarter of a century or so made. Brooklyn is now growing. The Jews are coming back. <laughs> if you ride out Ocean Parkway, as I did on a bicycle a couple of years ago in September, it looks like everybody in the world is of that faith. So that population is growing again. Immigrants, foreign born immigrants are in Brooklyn. It's now 37% foreign born. Its population is going up. I predict that in a few more years, it's going to surpass Chicago. Chicago has twice as much space as Brooklyn. Brooklyn has almost exactly the same population. But Brooklyn's population is going up. Chicago's population is going down. So Brooklyn, just think of the, the new neighborhoods. All those skyscrapers, really residential luxury towers along the East River, Williamsburg and, and Greenpoint and Long Island City. And think about the new buildings in Metro Tech and downtown Brooklyn. And think about the gentrification of Bushwick. Who would have ever thought? But also Sunset Park and so many neighborhoods. And of course, Brooklyn Heights is already there. And Bedford Stuyvesant, which was the largest ghetto in the United States, it's arguably the largest ghetto. It's got some wonderful streets in it, like Bay Street and others. So there's a problem with all this, and that is this gentrification everywhere. So if you don't own land in New York, and you don't have tenancy, legal tenancy in apartments, you're liable to be pushed out somewhere. But for the city as a whole, it's hard to argue that the city, and especially Brooklyn, aren't doing really well. Now, you know, Brooklyn is a place of first choice. It's not that you go to Brooklyn because you can't afford Manhattan anymore. You go to Brooklyn because it's a great place to live. Prospect Park has been revitalized, like Central Park has been revitalized. The neighborhoods, Coney Island is being rebuilt. The Rockaways are coming back. So, you know, this is also Queens, I know, by the way. So, but, but it's, it, it's foreign born people who have made those places thrive again. I think they will continue to thrive. Thank you so much, Professor Jackson, for taking us on that journey through New York history. What a treat, thank you. I'd also like to thank each and every one of our viewers for joining us here. Upcoming, we have our final Columbia Connects program, which is a New York City-based program, and that's going to be held on Tuesday, November 12th at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is our annual New York City-based Columbia Connects program, and we will be hosting it this year at the Time Warner Building in the Ascent Lounge. So we hope to see some of you there as we culminate all our Columbia Connects programming. 
For more details, please visit us at columbiaconnects.alumni.columbia.edu. And now in closing, I just want to say on behalf of the Columbia Alumni Association, thank you again to all our viewers, to our followers. Um, we would love to hear from you. And after this talk concludes, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. So please take a moment and do that. Thank you again, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Take care. <laughs>